Thank you to everybody for showing up for this. Again, I can't believe how many people are here and how many old friends and new friends and people that we know and love are here. Diane's whole family almost. But I have one special person to thank. Nina Lefke is, is the one that organized this for me. And without her, we would be four people sitting at my card table. <laughs> she puts a lot of work into this and just thanks everybody for attending this year. This is your first year in attendance. You'll be treated to some people that have great life stories. Unlike last year, I am going to remember to introduce our, our moderator, Mike Max, to bring him to the podium. Mike is the business man in town. He does a great job for this event. Sit back, enjoy the life stories you're about to hear, and afterwards take time to mingle. There's going to be cocktails and some hors d'oeuvres back at the room. Enjoy yourself. And have a great time. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Chip. Thank you for remembering to introduce me this year. So you last year, you were supposed to get up. You know, we didn't know what your age, who it was, and you got served for a bit. What a wonderful job he does every year bringing people together. And what I love about this is there's no agenda. This is not a business meeting. This is not a networking group, although you may network. This is about coming out here on election day and remembering what's really important in life. Now, I had the advantage because I already interviewed all of our guest speakers today for videos that you'll get. And it was an emotional roller coaster sitting with each one of them and listening to them tell their story. Uh, you are in for a treat, and you are, <laughs> you're going to take some things away today that are going to remind you why we're really here. Really here, not just here, but here. With these gifted speakers and what they've been through to get to here today. You heard our first speaker already. You heard him playing his instrument. Because that's his gift. He knows that music is a way that he can go out and minister and do much more. He's also got a military background. Uh, those two things you'll find can marry each other quite well. But in addition to that, he sees that life is a purpose-driven challenge every day. And it's our job to figure out what our purpose is in life. And man, has he done that. Our first guest speaker, you heard him already perform, Johnny Holiday. Come on up. Hey, Dad. How are you doing? Good? Can you hear me? This is proof that Latinos don't need microphones. All right? Normally, I introduce myself as Johnny Holiday, and I say, hola, como esta, buenos días. And then I say, hola, what's up, hola, and then y'all look at me like that, and I'm like, wrong country, my bad. <laughs> All right, before I go any further, there are some people I would like to introduce you to that are very close to me, and they, they continue to just encourage me and stuff. And my boss, Matt Duane, he did not do this. He did not was going to do this, so if I don't get a pay raise this year, it's y'all's fault. Matt, please stand up. Although she's not my direct supervisor, but she always tells me what to do, Sarah Baggett. Stand up. Yeah. We also have Mr. and Mrs. Jensen, who are close to my heart. Stand up. All right. And, and they have like the coolest farm, because they got these cows with their long hair. You're not your typical cow. And the meat is good. <laughs> I'm just saying. So you want some legit meat? That's the people to go to right there. Um, so anyways, first of all, I'd like to thank God for the opportunity to be able to share with you a little bit of things that I've experienced. Tim, where you at? Thank you, sir, for the invitation. I'm honored to, to, to participate in your event. I've read up on some of the stuff that you've been doing more and more. And really, really encouraging and inspiring that this gentleman does a lot for the for the the community. So I was going to share with you a little bit. Yeah, I forgot to tell you that my wife told me to 
set a timer because Latinos like to talk a lot too as my boss, as my supervisor. They know firsthand. So anyways, what I'd like to talk to you about is a couple of things. Uh, the far picture on the far left is me in Kharkiv, Iraq. I was deployed the second time. Uh, loved it. Didn't really care to get shot at and mortared, but it was, comes with the package. And uh, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed many, meeting very many, many different types of nationalities and stuff. I was raised all over the world, so I, I was, it was easy for me to blend in and get to know people. Uh, so anyways, throughout my life, I really had no idea what I was going to be doing uh, in, in the future. You know, I was 19 years old. How many of y'all got 19 years old? Well, how many of you had 19 years old? Is that sure? All right. Any military members in here? Hey. Ah, you're so fast. You're like, you got to give me a second. The light is kind of throwing me off. Thank you for your service. Any first responders? First responders at all? Okay. Well, if I didn't see you, thank you for your service. But in my earlier years, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew I had a gift of music, and you know, I was like, yeah, I'm a high school band, college band, whatever. And then later on, I got introduced to different styles of music that I didn't realize you could do with horns. I didn't realize you could also put as many horns on stage as you want. I, you know, I thought I was like, who would do that? Well, then there's a guy that I met named Phil Driscoll, who's a famous, famous evangelist, music evangelist, and he had like 20 of the things on there. I was like, ah. Uh, so, but anyway, so things were getting exposed to me throughout my life. And uh, as I started progressing, I went to the military from 88 to 93 for the first set, first set of it. Hated it. I was a bomb loader. Nobody told me that when I got out of the military, I would be a luggage loader for Delta Airlines. <laughs> Too much work for my taste. So anyways, did some stuff. I worked at the awesome, awesome company called Blockbuster. Y'all remember that? Anybody under the age of 50, you don't know nothing. All right? So anyways, uh, I was excited because I got free movies. And, you know, when the new ones come out, you got to let the people, like, get them first. I was a heathen. I hate those movies from the people. <laughs> and I watched them all. So anyways, uh, I lasted a whole week there. It was good. I didn't realize you needed to build, you needed to have people skills in that kind of career field. So when I saw somebody put movies where they weren't supposed to be, my boss happened to overhear me say, hey, is that where you found it? Well, freaking put it back. <laughs> and then I saw this. And then like, so I know, I go back to the house, I'm fired. So learning curve, we're good. We learned from there. Got involved with offshore oil rig. Started doing stuff with offshore oil rigs. And then uh, met my beautiful wife uh, and got married. Had some kids. I told her after the fourth one, I don't want any more Mexicans in my house because there's a little more tax break. Okay? We maxed the tax break level. And uh, so she was kind to oblige me in that area. And then um, moved on. Then I got offered to go for sniper school in the Army, but they wanted too much rank for me, and I couldn't provide for my family. So I went back into the Air Force in 03 after the towers and all the stuff went down in 01. Got involved, was going for special operations. At that time, I was already done with music. I'd been doing concerts throughout the nation and other countries and, and music, uh, uh, music ministries. And, and uh, just realized I got tired of dealing with people because they were lazy. They didn't want to take care of business and the work that it goes in, in to do with concerts and stuff like that. Uh, so I was going to give up the music career, did what I did in the military, uh, until a very high-ranking uh, individual told me, like, you know, I, I, you're going to go further in, in life than you would as a pararescueman. I'm telling you, he was part of Special Forces. I was like, okay, so I made the decision to go back into the music scene, but offered to go to sniper school. Well, that got shot down because of whatever. Um, uh, but it wasn't because of me, I'm just saying, I don't miss, okay? Just telling you. Uh, anyways, I, so I went on to do things with security forces and Air Force. I ended up doing a lot of music performances, playing for generals, playing for individuals from all over the world that I couldn't even put on my website because of their clearance. I played for the Trump presidency. I got pulled off of security detail to go play for them. And they asked me if I had any questions. I was like, yeah, what's your budget? You know? They laughed and I was like, okay, that's a polite way of saying they got done. So um, anyway, so I performed for them. I performed uh, at major sporting events like the uh, NFL, uh, 
what's the people, baseball people, MLB, MLB, right? Yeah. Clearly you can tell I don't like sports that much. And, uh, and then I ended up doing the National Anthem for the Vikings in seven degree weather. Has anyone attempted to play trumpet in seven degree weather? Yeah, who, what? Who said yeah? No, okay. Well, when I got asked to do that three days before the performance, um, I told my wife, I was at the, we were at uh, Gander Mountain looking at guns for myself. And, um, and they got, I got the call and they said, um, you know, we would like for you to perform the national anthem. I was like, okay. And I was like, when? Three days. Okay. What time? Evening. Okay. How many tickets do I get? And they're like, how many you want? Don't ever ask how many tickets does Johnny Holiday want? Because I want to invite people I don't even know. Do you understand? So anyways, so I got the game going, did the national anthem. That performance skyrocketed me in the hundreds of thousands in the, on the of YouTube circuit and Facebook and the other stuff like that. I worked with an amazing unit, had an amazing boss who believed in what I did. I uh, got, got to do a lot of joint training with uh, and operations with uh, Navy SEALs, Special Forces Group, Presidential Sniper Teams. I eventually became an urban warfare instructor, specializing in uh, special weapons and tactics. Any law enforcement people here? Law enforcement? Former? Prior? Past life? I think? Oh, so I can tell you all the lies and you wouldn't know if I was telling the truth. <laughs> all right, I like this game. So anyways, so I got involved with that, and I ended up being stationed up here in Minneapolis. And throughout my whole career, one thing I didn't notice is the fact of... I forgot there's horns there. Um, there has to be a reason for anything you do in life. There has to be. And the number one thing that I find when people transition from the military to civilian is the loss of purpose. In the military, we're given purpose. We were, do, we were directed to do missions. We were directed to do what we had to do. There was always constant direction. And um, I remember really struggling with that because if I didn't have purpose, I found a purpose. I made it a point. I tried different things. I didn't care what it was. I just tried things. I'm not the kind that just sits back and waits for, for uh, God to open a door. No, I'm, I'm checking the doors, you know? And the thing is I'm finding purpose. A lot of people today, even the civilian circuit, and I'm realizing how much y'all suffer too, that y'all at times struggle with finding a purpose. Find something. It may not be a long time, a long-term uh, uh, purpose, but it gets you starting to do something. Once you find that purpose, you have to utilize that purpose to serve. My brother told me one day, who, who I used to travel with around the world playing, he said, he'd call me, and he would always call me like the most oddest times, like midnight, when I'm up doing nothing. And he would, he would try to contact me, he goes, so, hey bro, like, so what are you going to do with the music, with, with, with your game plan? I was like, oh, yeah, you know, play, get famous, make money, I don't know. He goes, is that what you really want to do? I said, no, man, I just want to share the gift that I've been given. He said, then you got to make it more than about yourself. You need to serve others with that gift. Don't matter if you feel like it or not. Share it with somebody. Encourage somebody. You can't go wrong in sharing the talent that God has given you. But to keep it for yourself, you're going to burn out really fast. Because all you just focus on me, me, me. So I started understanding the concept of to serve. Now, in the career field, that what I did is uh, they, one of the, 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 rule, the rules that we go by, one of the laws that we go by is uh, serve, uh, service before self. So I started doing that and playing in it where people would say, can you do the National Anthem at my retirement? Yeah. How much you charge? Nothing. I'm not charged for that. So I started serving with a purpose. And it led to other things, other opportunities. Next thing I know, I'm, uh, any basketball fans up in here? One? <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Y'all act like they're y'all gonna fail a test or something. When I got out of the military, there's no more test. We don't have any tests, right, sir? Like, okay, thank you, Jesus. Okay, so who, who said they know basketball like basketball? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Willie, you don't count. You're a saxophone player and you play with me. 
<laughs> Anybody else? Who's a, who's a basketball fan? Anybody? Okay, why are you helping him raise your hand? Look at you just thrown under the bus like that and everything. You ever heard of an NCAA Final Four Championship? Well, I didn't. Okay, that's what my mark's right there. <laughs> Shut up. So anyways, um, I got asked to play the National Anthem at the Final Four Championship solo, a cappella. And I had more fun to... Um, to be able to share that with my troops at the, at the game, then I actually had fun playing it. Does that make sense? I was blessed more and excited more about them experiencing that opportunity that you know they're never going to give you unless somebody else like me comes along. And to see them and watch them and serve them that way gives you purpose, validity. Does that make sense? So when you do things in life and you want to accomplish something, Pick something. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's going to make you grow as a person, it's going to bring success to not only you, to others around. And if it's going to encourage others, then serve that purpose. Okay? And people, I get all the time when they ask me, well, you know, I failed. Well, what do you mean you failed? You never even showed up. I love what David Goggins said, a famous speaker from SEALs. He's like, you have to show up to do something in order to fail. But if you don't show up, you never failed. You just didn't show up. And that's the type of person that doesn't make a decision. In the military, we always talk about making a decision. I don't care if it's wrong or right, you make the decision. So I've learned that throughout my life. Now, when it comes to service, it's not going to always be convenient for you. I promise you. If you haven't already known this, it's not going to be convenient. It's always at the worst time. But that's the best time because that's the most time that it's mostly needed. I was at the store recently, and I'm going to close out with a quick song. Uh, uh, I was at the store recently, and uh, this gentleman was coming up to me. We locked eyes in the middle of the parking lot. I'm like, God, this guy's going to talk. Now, my boss and supervisor know I like to talk, but I was just not in the mood. I wanted to get in the store and get out. That's all I wanted. This guy was looking at me, and he's like, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. How are you? He's like, uh, good. I said, well, it's not hot. But of course, it was like 95 degrees. He goes, what? What do you mean it's not hot? It's hot. I go, no, I've been a lot hotter. Trust me. And he's like, oh, yeah, where? I said, oh, all over the world. And I kept walking. He kept following me. And then he says, uh, he says to me, he says, uh, where, where, where'd you go? Like military stuff? I was like, yeah, I was in the military. And he goes, oh, okay. You still that? No. Nope. Who do you work for? Government. Who? Don't matter. Dude, I'm just not going to talk. And then my wife called me. I was like, maybe he'll get the hint. I don't want to talk. I'm talking to my wife. And he keeps talking to me. And I'm like, did I say in Spanish you don't understand? So uh, I told my wife, I said, babe, let me get off the phone. I got to deal with this guy. Okay, cool. And now he's a young man, got tats all over him, teardrop, thick, you know, and um, clearly hasn't been to prison. And uh, we go in there. I go, what do you need? He goes, man, I have to talk to you. I said, get to the point. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the story, he starts crying in front of everybody and telling me his life story. And I was like, all I wanted was a bag of Cheetos, <laughs> you know? But he's talking to me. And all I could do is just shut up and listen. When he got done talking to me, I was like, I could tell it was coming to the end of him. And he says to me, uh, uh, I told him, I said, hey, he goes, yeah. Shut up. He's like, what? I said, look, man, if you're looking for empathy, I'm not that guy. If you're looking for sympathy, I'm not that guy. Because it's this. I know you wanted to be military. Well, clearly you're not going in. You're not going to law enforcement. Why aren't you going to medical field to serve others? He's like, well, I don't know about that. See, there you go. You really don't want to serve. You want to do it at your convenience, and that's not how you serve. It's always going to be out of convenience when it's mostly most needed. I said, you know, you talk about all these, uh, these uh, uh, 
curbs and walls that are blockaded throughout your whole life. You know the military that separates people like me from you? He's like, what? Those are obstacles. And you know what obstacles are designed for? To conquer. It doesn't matter if you go over it, around it, under it. You still conquer it. Don't let it stop your purpose. And I said, you let that stop you. I said, you and I make decisions in our life is why we're at where we're at. There's people all over the world that are going through stuff they don't deserve. They never want to be a part of it. So really, we have nothing to say. And he was like, well, what do you suggest I do? Go to detox 30 days. Go to Team Challenge and get squared away. And then come out with a purpose and ready to serve. He said, but it's so humiliating. I go, but bro, you're in the middle of a struck line in front of everybody with a stranger. That's not emotional most of the time, sir. Okay? And you were by, I said, I know somebody that personally has been humiliated more beyond that any man could ever go through. And he's like, who's that? And I said, Christ. And he's like, oh. I said, yeah, you and I, we're just, it's our egos that get hurt. Our pride gets hurt. That's humiliating. And if you don't humble yourself in life and come to the knowledge that you know you need help, you're always going to be at the bottom of the pit. And when you're tired, dude, that's when you're going to start right uh, fighting. But it can't be just about yourself. This incident can be about that testimony to encourage others. So when you want to do things in life and you want to uh, motivate others, find a purpose. Willie, I'm ready. Where are you at? And uh, find a purpose. And when you get that purpose, share that dream with just a select few. You don't need to share that out with the whole world because you're going to find people that will tell you you can't do it. You don't need that. You need people that will motivate you, that will tell you, hey, great job. Hey, you're, you're screwing up. Get your game face on. Those are the people you want around you to build you up. That's one thing I can honestly say at the agency I work for. They do that. Our team does that to each other. And it's nothing but motivation and courage to help others and inspire others. One thing I learned from my wife, for sure, is that she has a genuine servant's heart. Every day I have to work, every day I have to work at being a, at serving people. Because it's not my common character. So whatever it is you do, when you find your purpose, serve that purpose to build others up and to accomplish what you need to do. Cool? All right, you having a good time so far? All right, so we're going to close up one song, and it's a short song, so uh, if anything I want to be known for in this world, when, I, when it's all said and done, this is what I would like to be. Oh yeah, is my system on? Okay. When the music fades into the past When my days of life are through what will be remembered of where I've come when all is said and done? Will they see I loved my family? That I was a faithful friend and that I live to tell of God's own son when all is said and done. Oh, I long to see the hour 
when I will hear that trumpet sound and rise to see a Savior's face just to see and smile and a sway well done you can't forget my name and the songs that I've sung every rhyme and every tune I remember the truth of my Jesus' love when I said when I said and Thank you, God bless you. I still have one second left. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. Dan Fagan is a guy I've known for a long time. He works at uh, the tradition companies, the banking division, and like so many of us, uh, he lives here and is comfortable living the American dream with a wife and a family and all the things that we get involved in and a strong faith. But what you're about to hear is that sometimes that faith needs to be recharged a little bit. And sometimes we don't have a choice in when or how that happens. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Dan Packer. All right, Johnny, thank you for that beautiful music. You and Willie, I appreciate it. Maxie, thanks for the, for the invite. It was great to see you the other day and praying for you and your family. And I want to thank uh, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming here today. Tim, you're an inspiration to us all. I want to thank you so much for your vision, for the force for good, and for today's event to be an encouragement to others. Thanks for inviting me to share. Well, we all have a story, don't we? And we're all living by faith in something or someone. Who or what do you have your faith in? Well, here's my story. And I'm going to tell you up front, it's a faith-filled story. I grew up in South Suburban Chicago in a town called South Holland. I have uh, youngest of three. My sister's here with me today. And my wife is too. Um, but my sister joined. She's six years older. My brother's eight years older. And I uh, grew up in South Suburban Chicago, and our parents divorced when, when I was 13. Let's just say it wasn't, wasn't the ideal childhood. But, uh, but I'm not blaming anybody, that's just, it is what it is. But if I could summarize my mindset from that childhood, it was basically coming out of that in a performance-driven mindset. 
for having control, for seeking love, for seeking acceptance, and for avoiding being kind of abandoned or rejected. Uh, living a life more in fear and not having that perfect peace, that was kind of where I was. So at an early age, I was driven to go to college, you know, coming out of high school, driven to go to college, get a job, get married, have kids, build a nest egg, life will be great and perfect. That's how it works, right? You just take control of everything. Control your own destiny. Put your faith in yourself and put your faith in financial security. I know there's some planners here. I'm not going to ruin your job, but that's where my faith was. Not really growing up in the church. I was confirmed Lutheran when I was young, but I really didn't grow up in the church, and, and yet something inside of me wanted to believe that God existed. In March of 1993, I was at Northern Illinois University, and uh, I interviewed to be a bank examiner with the FDIC. It was a, a job that paid 20 some thousand a year and looked like a good career. So I interviewed with them and they said, you have the job, but you have to have a certain GPA to get this job. And I said, okay, and so what does that mean? That means I need to get three A's and two B's my last semester. So I have a little Nissan pickup. I'm in DeKalb, Illinois. There's a lot of corn out there. So I drive out to the cornfield and just look up and just say, God, if you want me to get this job, please help me to get these grades. But if you don't, I'll understand and there's something else for me. I was sincere in that prayer. Well, I got the grades, I got the job, no thanks to God in that. Um, just ready to move on. 18 months later on a bank exam, I met my wife for the first time. And uh, lo and behold, we end up getting married, moved to Minnesota in 1997. Shortly after, I took a job at a local bank called Western Bank back in the day, working hard, having kids, cranking on that hamster wheel. I think we've all been on that hamster wheel. Hopefully, we're not all on it, but you, I think you know what I'm talking about. I met a guy named Eric Hendrickson in, in around 2000, and, uh, and I really liked this guy. We hit it off uh, from the get-go, and, uh, and I loved the tradition companies and, and what they had built. And so 2004 comes along, it's a fairly significant year in, in my life. And so as I'm going through life and in the grinding of life and, and at this point having success, you know, I'm married, I've got the kids, I've got a nice home, a nicer home than I ever grew up in. Good job, financial security to some degree, but yet I'm still not at peace. There's still just this unsettled and in a weird way, I kind of feel guilty about what God has given me and I have a sense that I should just be doing more but I just don't know what I'm missing. And I have this big misunderstanding that to be a Christian, I need to, to sell everything and move to Africa and be a missionary. Why do we think that? Am I the only one that thinks that? I don't know. Well, I thought that. And I went to Africa last year. It was really cool, by the way. That's a whole different story. God has a wonderful sense of humor. Then in August of 2004, I had a weekend here in town at XL Energy Center. It was called Promise Keepers and my neighbor invited me to this event and, and I ended up going and, and over the course of the weekend I found out that God just, he really loves me and he doesn't need me to go to Africa, he just wants a relationship with me and he's going to use me right where I'm at. So I thought that really sounds good, no move to Africa, perfect. So for the first time in my life, my wife knows this, I wanted to go to church that next morning, I didn't have to, like I wanted to. And, uh, and the message I had heard the night before was this message in 1 Corinthians that talks about the body of Christ that's made up of many parts. And we all have a form and a function. We all have a purpose, Johnny. We all have a purpose and we're created with a purpose. And I'm like, that sounds pretty good. So I could be a banker and I don't have to move to Africa and I can do this. I'm in. So I was excited. So I wanted to go to church and I heard 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that next morning. Night before, next morning. So I committed my life to the Lord and within a month, all of a sudden, I'm at Bear Path playing golf with Reed Evenson and Eric Hendrickson. And lo and behold, that was the beginnings of the Tradition Capital Bank story. There were beginnings in that before, but that was just one little part in it. God put this desire in my heart to help start a company where I could put him first and I could honor him in all that I do. I remember being so excited with this good news about living a life with purpose. And so I remember my first meeting with Tim Benebeck. Tim, I don't know if you remember this, but I was in that old 6,800 building. All you mortgage guys know that building, or I think we all do. We all spent a lot of time there. And I was in that boardroom and I'm sitting across from Tip 
And I just said, Tim, I just gave my life to the Lord. I'm going to give my life to my family, but everything else I got is yours. And I'll be all in on tradition. And Tim's comment was pretty simple. He said, that's great. We just don't wear that around our shirt sleeve around here. So he's all in. He's saying, you know what? I love what you're all about. So I'm in and I'm ready to go. Unfortunately, what I didn't realize is I'm about ready to take those performance-driven tendencies to a whole new level. Let's just say I was saved, but not fully surrendered. Over the past 18 years, I'd summarize my life as follows. Striving to please God. Striving to please man. Striving to please my wife. Unsettled in my spirit, having really good days, but just as quickly having a life in fear. Fear of losing what I have. Fear of losing my wife. Fear of not doing a good enough job at the bank. Fear that I'm not doing enough for God. I gotta do more. At my core, I'm not even certain that my kids love me, that my wife loves me. <laughs> loves me or that God even loves me. Pretty messed up, huh? Yet on the outside, it might appear as that I have it all together. So coming into 2023, I'm coming off some of the most stressful years in my life. We all go through the COVID era. That was actually kind of a piece of cake, but um, we go through COVID. Then we have uh, a good friend of mine and our COO at our company um, has a life altering event. And then we get into 2022 and 2023. And we have uh, the fastest interest rate hikes recorded in our history, or at least for that period of time. I know the 1980s, I was there. Um, those were pretty significant, but this was the fastest that they went up in a period of time. And that meant that our margins and our profits are getting crushed. And then all of a sudden there's these bank failures and there's this liquidity panic reminiscent of the bank runs and failures in the 1930s. And I'm going through all this thinking you're a failure and there's demons from my past. You're not good enough. You're going to lose what you have. Your wife is going to leave you all your worst Fears are coming true. So during these times, these dark days, and guys, I'm going through Bible study and stuff. It's not like, and, and all of you know me here, so it's you're probably thinking, where was all this at? It's there. And I think um, it's there. Um, let's just say it's there. So during these dark days, a good friend of mine and a strong man of God, Tim Savaloy, was kind enough to listen to me and was helping me process through some of these issues. And on May 16th, one day before the event that was the greatest, one of the greatest gifts in my life, Tim and I met for two hours. And I've got this on paper, you can ask Tim, because uh, he had it in writing, and Tim was sharing with me. I've heard very strongly from God for about three weeks, he wants to set you free. I believe it's God's desire 100% for healing to take place and for freedom for fears that plague you. And then he said this, Dan, I hate to ask this, and this has only happened to me two times before, but I've been fervently praying for you. I've been praying for you and for your health. Specifically, are there any issues that stress or worry are causing? Anything in your chest, your stomach, or lower GI? I know it sounds strange, but God keeps bringing this up. And my response was pretty clear. I'm fine. I'm great. I'm stronger than ever. Nothing's wrong with me. You can, maybe it's a metaphor, must be a metaphor. And at that moment, in hindsight now, I'm looking back thinking, wow, that was a pretty prideful statement. Just 24 hours later, it's 5.45 p.m. I'm getting ready. It was another normal day for me. And uh, I'm getting ready to grill on my deck. I start the grill. I sit down. And all of a sudden, I get this pain, this pain that starts in my chest, in my upper chest, and it kind of just kind of tears right through my body. And I'm, I'm sitting on the chair, and all of a sudden, then I'm, I, it starts in my chest, it goes in my back, I'm on the floor, I'm going, what? And if you've had a bad back, it's like a spasm times 10, just, you can't get comfortable. I whip my, chuck my phone at the window, and I'm like, honey, my back, like, what is going on? So she opens the door, and, uh, and she just thinks it's my back, and, and she knows me, and, and I've had some, uh, like, acid reflux stuff, so we're, 
I, I literally crawl inside. I remember crawling inside, but then the pain, at least that whatever I had just experienced went away. And, uh, and I just thought that was really weird. Um, and so she's looking up like acid reflux and stuff. And, and I just said, kid, let's just go to urgent care. Let's just check this out. And we were waiting for Donald 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So anyways, we decided to go to urgent care. They hooked me up initial test and my heart is fine. Heart's great. Everything's good. They give me Valium, um, but it's not working. And the nurse at some point starts getting a little bit concerned and, and all of a sudden they're like, we need, we need to get a CT scan. And so I couldn't, I wasn't quite comfortable enough to get down. So they're like, you got to give them fentanyl right now. We got to get this done. And immediately once I was in the CT scan, you could just see the level of concern go right through the roof. Basically I had suffered a complete aortic dissection, starting with my ascending aorta and it went all the way down, falling all the way down my back, all the way to my pelvis. So it was kind of a, a full blown aortic dissection. I didn't, rupture my aorta that I'd be dead uh, a rupture means that sucker's open and that's your biggest uh, artery or vessel I'm still not an expert on this but um, it's just not a good situation my inner layer tore and what that basically means is especially with the ascending you need to get surgery and get it right away so within two hours I'm about to have emergency open heart surgery the docs prep my wife 99% chance of death if you don't have surgery 20% chance you're not going to make it if we go in. And I, I don't remember anything like that. We went in and I think God's given me that gift in a lot of ways to not have a good memory. But um, anyways, I don't remember that much. I remember she, she's tough. I remember from what she tells me, I'm kind of like, I got to golf tomorrow. I have time for surgery. And, and, uh, and I'm like, then I'm asking like the guy, Hey, what's your favorite scripture, man? Like, you know, do you know Jesus? Like I'm just, you know, sharing stuff. Uh, but then it gets serious, and, and when they wheeled me away, apparently I said goodbyes to my wife, and, and I said, God's got this. She also shared that that night, both her and the boys, we, we had dinner the other night, we're going through texts, going through the text strand, it was pretty cool, that both my wife and the boys were all calm, and they had a peace and in them and they weren't worried, which is really cool. Well, it was an eight hour surgery and the surgeon and the team were amazing. It was at the University of Minnesota. In fact, I think they said they had fun, right? I mean, was that kind of, yeah. Like they had fun, like, hey man, that was a good surgery, we had a lot of fun. Whatever that's worth. I think that means it went really well is what they're saying. So I had open heart surgery, you know, the whole deal and, um, it's crazy to think they, they cut you wide open, they saw your sternum in half, open you up. Um, they replaced a section of my ascending aorta, so I got a synthetic aorta. And, and the guy said I got a good another 100,000 miles in me. So anyways, um, so I'm in the hospital. So I'm trying to remember this recovery, and I just remembered several things in this recovery. First of all, I remember this overwhelming thankfulness to God, knowing he saved my life in that it was a huge gift. I never once was bitter towards him during this time, not once. Aside from not sleeping well, I didn't, it was kind of rough to sleep when you just have open heart surgery. I had this like sweet peace and just this gratefulness for the staff. And let's face it, I'm in a hospital, right? <laughs> and I spent four days in ICU and three days and, and sharing a room with another dude. So, you know, I'm thinking, isn't this 2023? But, um, I don't know, our kids have all these nice places. Why can't I have my own hospital room? <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> but the whole point is I didn't complain. And if you know me, like I, I'm eating hospital food and I'm doing all this stuff. I'm loving grapes and, and whatever I'm eating in the morning. I'm just like, it was like really weird. But then I also never forget this. And this was a cool moment, one of the coolest ones. I remember one time when I was in what I call a deep sleep. I was in a deep sleep. I couldn't sleep for a while and I fell into a deep sleep and I woke up overjoyed knowing that God was healing me. And that night, just that night when I was in the room, God had done a good work in me and he made a beautiful covenant with me. And this is the covenant. I'm going to give you some context to my story and I'm going to try to speed up my speaking so I can get through this because um, I'm almost sort of done. So, 
So basically, for the context, I'm going to read Genesis 15. And God made a covenant with me, and he made a covenant with Abraham back in the day. It says it to Abram. Um, Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. And Abram believed him, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also, and so Abram then says, how can I know that I'll gain possession of this? And he said, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. He brought them out. He cut them in two and raised them in halves opposite of each other. After the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness covered him. And when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between him with pieces. And this was back in the old way, a way of making a covenant with someone. So God basically walked through while Abram was sleeping and made this promise. And in my own heart, this is what God was saying to me. Like, I love you. And basically he, I'm going to not get to, like, don't worry, I'm not stripping up here. But that's what happened to me. And God basically says, I'm cutting you in half and I'm walking through you and I'm sealing it up and you're all mine. And it was a beautiful promise that God made. And he says, I'm going to restore you to full health. Every time you look at that scar, remember how much I care for you and you can always rest in me. I remember him whispering, your faith will make you well. And I believed I'd be fully healed. Tip, this is what faith, hope, and courage, and action is all about. I had faith in God. I had hope in knowing and trusting he has a plan. And I had the courage to move forward. I knew it wasn't going to be an easy road. What happened over the next several months was truly amazing. The outpouring of love was so crazy. I can't even begin to thank so many, if not most of you, all of you in this room for reaching out with texts and cards and prayers and support and written letters. I I can't even begin to thank you. Each time I would open those, I'd have tears in my eyes. And it was unbelievable. I want to thank our, our board and our entire TCB team for stepping up. For, for running the bank, for allowing me to rest and recover. I can tell you when I, when, while I missed the, my time away, there was never one time that I doubted that we had the best team and that everything was in good hands. So thanks to everyone at the bank that, that stepped up. Believe it or not, I took my job to recover seriously. I knew that rest and sleep was important, healthy eating, plenty of protein, strict physical therapy would give me the best road to recovery. Of course, thanks to all of your prayers, And by the grace of God, my recovery, I'm not kidding, was faster and better than, at least they were telling me this. I don't know if this is true or not. I swear. I'm like, if you guys are messing with me, I'm not going to be happy. But they did. They said, you know what? This is unbelievable. And I said, you know what? I I don't doubt that one bit because I know people have been praying for me and I know a God who loves me and he's the one who gives me strength. During these months, you can imagine it was a roller coaster physically and emotionally. And I actually think it was tougher on my wife. than it was on me. She had to process losing her husband, potentially, taking care of the kids. And then when I came back, I was kind of lost for a little while. And she knew uh, she knew she lost me for a little bit, but now I'm back on me so you can relax. <laughs> and then she had to deal with me in a weak and a defeated state. That's a whole other thing. So what did I learn and how has this changed my life? First, I learned plain and simple, I am not in control. None of us are in control. God loved me so much that he said, you know what, I'm going to teach you a wonderful lesson here. You're not that important. You are, but you aren't. And I don't need you for anything. I want you to have an amazing and abundant life, but I don't need you to do anything. Stop striving so much. Second, I have nothing to fear. You come close to that, you know, I know that God has saved me for, for his purposes and the life I live, I now live by faith in him. And he's going to call me home when my work is finished here. Next, I realized how foolishly I worried about so many things. I'm going to stop worrying and start living. Now, you guys can record that. I think we're recording this. But I think we worry about so many of the stupidest things around here. And if we would just rest in him, 
and just care for others, I think my takeaway was I just want to love God and love people more. I also realized how blessed I am, but most importantly, I'm going to abide in the scripture that's on the mantle of my home, and that's Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I'm God. Another version of it says, see striving. Stop striving in your own strength to be loved or to be, to, to be accepted or to please God or to please man or stop striving for peace and security or for approval or for fulfillment or for, for salvation. God promises in me, you have everything you could ever want or need. So like I shared at the beginning, we all have a story. I don't have any crazier story than any of you. I don't even feel worthy to be up here. This was really not a big deal. Um, it just kind of happened and I'm fine. Like, so there's a lot more people that have a lot better story than I do. But thanks for sharing, Tim. Thanks for letting me share. But we all have a story and we all have a faith in someone or something. And I asked you before, where is your faith? I tried the route of faith in myself and in things, and I can tell you it's empty and deceiving. Jesus promises that he has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. He shares that he's the vine and we're the branches, and if we remain in him, he'll remain in us and we'll bear much fruit. And apart from him, we can do nothing. Not something, not anything, nothing. Thanks to my aortic dissection, I'm telling you, this is what I shared with Maxie. This took a lot, but I now have fully surrendered. I know who's in control of my life. My life. I know who loves me. I know I don't have to please anybody or any person. The bank is going to do just fine no matter what happens. Doesn't mean we're not going to uh, work hard and do the best that we can. It's just that's out of my control. It's out of all of our control. And so what does that mean to be surrendered? There's a, there's a verse that goes, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm just going to wrap up with a, a prayer, and, um, and I'm done. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thanks for each and every one of these people here. God, you're such a gracious and loving and holy and perfect God. We just, we just praise you for this day. We thank you for our life and our health and our families. Thank you for people like Tip and so many others that you've put in my life to help show us and teach us and guide us. We're grateful for our fellowship together, and I just pray, God, that if anybody in this room is, is struggling or if they just don't know you, I just pray, God, they would reach out and that you would just touch them right where they're at, that they would come to know you. They would know how much you love them and you care for them and you want nothing more but the best for them. So, Father, we give you the rest of this day and we ask this all in your mighty name. Amen. All right. God bless you. And thanks for having us. Thank you, Dan, and for not knowing it, for describing all of us so many different ways when you describe your own journey through life. And we all think we're alone knowing. And everything you said is resonating with me. And you're going, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. Give it the clarity for all of us. Rob Wattlov, like Dan, has had some experiences in his life that have changed him. But he loves the outdoors. And he loves kids. And he learned along the way that sometimes you got to be patient before you exactly know what to do with the gifts that you've been given. Our next speaker, the outdoors, for sure he loves, but he loves God even more. Rob Wadlaw, come on up. Wow, two speakers to follow up. Love the, the heart of both of these men. And they're both talking about my Savior and what, what he's done in their lives. And I'm going to do the same thing. First, I'd like to thank the good Lord for the opportunity to share my story with you today here at Tradition, Faith, Hope, and Courage. Second, I'd like to thank Tim, Tim Benedict, for um, 
for asking me to speak. It's, it's really an honor. If you've done any history with uh, Tip, you know he was quite an athlete. He had a, uh, a model that he came up with, and I'm going to have to get my glasses off because I can't read this myself. His motto is courage, commitment, focus, and effort pursued with reckless abandon. You know, I read that for the first time, and it reminded me of playing football and in high school and, and uh, in college. It was a reckless abandon at 135 pounds in high school and 155 in college. <clears throat> Wild. Peter Vandenberg wrote a book called Into the Unknown, Recklessly Following the Call of God. He describes it this way. The greatest adventure of my life has been to follow the call of God. That's been my experience, too. But honestly, it hasn't always been that way. I was blessed to grow up in a Christian home. My mom and dad loved the Lord and they served the Lord their whole life. They were married for 66 years. I accepted Lord Jesus when I was 12 years old in daily vacation Bible school. And John 3, 16 was real to me, and I meant it as much as a 12-year-old could mean it. I always wanted to be a, a leader for some reason. And I was president of the class from 6th grade to 12th, through 12th grade. I uh, was captain of the football team, lettered in three sports. Went to Bethel, played college football for a year. Went to the University of Minnesota, had a wildlife management degree because of my love for the outdoors and uh, got married, and then uh, couldn't find a job in waterfall management. That's what I wanted to do. Now what do I do? I went back to school, got a secondary education degree in biology, and I taught seventh through 12th grade science, and I coached uh, football, basketball, and track, and later on softball. I've done a lot of different things in my life. Uh, been a sales manager, I've been a finance manager, I've been a general manager, part owner in a business, and uh, owner in two smaller businesses. I grew up hunting with my dad. He started when I was seven years old. You have to understand, I really enjoyed sports. I really enjoyed playing, and I played with everything I had. And I usually played both ways in all the games. But you know, you have to understand that I lived to hunt. I really wanted to, I was always thinking about hunting. I was always thinking about the next trip. It's always about more and more. In 1991, I purchased a barn, a farmhouse, and a garage out in the Laka Parle area. And I named it, of all things, Rob's Hunt Camp. Not much ego there. So, yeah. When I climbed up in the barn, the Lord whispered to me, I want you to start a ministry here. What? I don't have the money. I got a marriage that's failing. I said, I, I, I got a business that isn't doing that great. I don't know what to do. For 43 years of my life, from the time I was 12 to I was 55, was filled with a lot of really great things that happened. But during that time, it was also a time black and white was turned to gray and grayer was in my life. You see, pride and selfishness, which most men have a little bit of problem with, and greed for money, which I said would never, ever get a grip on me, along with my passions for hunting and fishing, which had turned into idols. That along with my first two wives finding somebody that they thought they loved more than me, ended in two divorces. Extremely crushing. Every, if any of you have ever been through divorce, you know it's a living hell for you and for your kids. Fortunately, I, only, I didn't have any kids in my first marriage and two in my second. Now into my third marriage with the real love of my life who's sitting in the third row down here, Joellen. We've been married for 25 years. Praise the Lord. I'm a blessed man to be married to her. We have four bright, wonderful children and six grandchildren. Now of all times, my business was failing. Every man knows their business isn't supposed to fail. That's not supposed to happen. And I was afraid my third marriage might fail too. What about my kids? 
Well, more, one morning in 2005, I was down in the basement of a Rogers home, and I was extremely depressed. I had made a good habit for some reason of reading uh, our daily bread, a little devotional. Maybe a lot of you have read that before. And you know, it wasn't the story, and it wasn't even the scripture. It was a little teeny poem down on the bottom of the first page. And that caught my eye. And then the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. And that poem went like this. Lord, I now surrender all of my pride, all of my selfishness, all of my passions, all of me. Please, Lord Jesus, come into my life and body. And that was everything that we had. To surrender seems like it's a negative thing, but it has a positive meaning. It means to give. I had given my life totally to Jesus Christ, my Lord. A great calm came over me, and a peace I hadn't felt for many years. I didn't think I'd probably ever hunt or fish again. I didn't, I didn't know that he'd let me do that. I'd given it up, and I meant it. That was a big part of my life. For the next two weeks, that thought was kind of in my head, and I thought, am I ever going to do that again? <laughs> and I'm uh, watching the show, and it's Angling Edge. Al Linder, famous Minnesota fisherman, and he's got this show on, and I'm watching that. At the very end, he's got a five-minute devotion that Al does. And in that devotion, here's the verse that came up. The mind of man plans his way. Yeah, I've been doing that all my life. But God directs the steps. In an instant, God was telling me, I gave you these passions for a reason. You've been using them selfishly all your life. Now let me direct the steps, and I'll show you what we're going to do with them and how we're going to use them to build my kingdom. Wow, what, a, what an awakening. I wasn't sure how, but I knew he was going to show me sometime. And the faith and the hope journeys began. In 2006, a year later, I'm in Canada hunting again for the 35th time in Manitoba hunting ducks and geese. And then it happened. I had a heart attack, a severe heart attack. I ended up in an ambulance from southern Manitoba going to Minot. And I called my wife, Joellen, and I said, here's what's going on. But I said, I want you to know I'm either going to wake up in your arms in the hospital or I'm going to wake up in the arms of Jesus. And she said, don't talk like that. And I said, no, honey, I said, I really mean it. I said, I'm at peace. I know I belong to the Lord. I didn't have a fear of dying that day, even though they told me I may not even make it to the hospital three and a half hours away at Mina. But I did have a question for God, and my question was this. Why am I still alive? And his wonderful, calm voice, he said, because I have more truth to teach you. That was his answer. I got the mine on. They checked me out. They said, your widowmaker is 100% blocked. You should be dead already. You've lost 50% of your heart muscle. It's died, and we can't do anything for you. But stabilize you. I ended up back in Minneapolis. Abbott Northwestern took a look at all my charts and everything, and they said, We can't operate. Because in your heart, the artery is in the form of a right angle, and the clot is right in the corner. We're afraid we're going to do more harm than good. So you may have to live with it. Live with a heart that's 50% gone and completely blocked, and I can't lift five pounds and can't even hardly walk around in my own house. I lived one whole month with my heart completely blocked, completely blocked. Every heartbeat was a miracle, and I knew it. Two weeks into that, the Bible said he came to my house, and I prayed over me, anointed me with oil, and I could feel the Holy Spirit come over the top of me. It was wonderful. Two weeks later, I'm in Mayo. How did I get to Mayo in two weeks like that? I got three world-renowned doctors working on me. They put a drill up one leg and a camera up the other. 
They worked for an hour and a half trying to get this clot out. They told my wife they just were ready to quit. They tried one more time. And they got the clot out. They put two stamps in. They're still there. They're still there. And I got out of the hospital actually the next day. Never was opened up. And I did my own therapy for one whole year, getting myself back in shape. I knew my own body well. I've been doing a lot of exercise before, done a lot of coaching. So I did that myself. But I had to go back to Mayo three times. I went back, and the first time they said, well, maybe you only lost 35% of your heart muscle. I said, well, that sounds better. Next time, well, maybe only 20%. Wow. Last time I went in, the doctor came in the office and looked at me and he's shaking his head. And I go, oh no, what's up, doc? He said, I don't get it. He said, I don't think you've lost any of your heart muscle. It's all functioning. I said, well, I get it. It's a miracle from God. He's got something for me to do. And I need to find out what it is. Here we go, into the rec recklessly following the call of God. In 2010, Legacy Fishing Retreat was formed. This is our logo. And ask Cody to come up because he's going to sing a song here in a minute. But I want to tell you, Legacy was formed in 2010 with the encouragement of two Barnabases in my life, Rob Passer and, and Chris Atkins. And three years later, it became a nonprofit. Our first thought was Legacy is supposed to be a ministry that takes men fishing and presents the God of creation to them and the God of love. But I have to tell you, God had a lot bigger plans than that. This is Cody James, one of our worship leaders for Legacy. He wrote a song that I'd like you to hear. I'm just going to stand over to the side and I'll finish up when he's done. But I hope you get as much out of this song as I do. When I heard you call, though I had my share of faults, I served you through my ears. Like a soldier running the race, but I feel the change is taking place. And now my path don't seem so clear. You said be still and know I'm God. So I'm hanging on with everything I've got And I'm asking for an answer Though I feel I'm losing to the fear I only want to go where you will lead me So Lord, where do I go from here? You brought me such a long way But something's happened to my faith Cause right now You brought me such a long way But something's happened to my faith Cause right now it seems so strong Did I overthink and take control? Or did I just get comfortable? Really like to know. You say, Do not be afraid. So I'm hanging on to you every word with every breath that I take. And I'm asking for an answer. I feel I'm losing to the fear. All I want to go where you would lead me. So, Lord, where do I go from here? It's in the valley that you've always drawn me near. It doesn't no matter how long it takes, I will stand right here. Believe me. For that answer and fighting off the fear, I only want to go.
started those retreats, one of the first retreats we had flopped. God, I thought this is what you wanted us to do. Pete, who's sitting out here in the audience, invited me to go to a banquet, and I heard somebody speak up at the Teen Challenge, at a, another banquet, and as a Teen Challenge fellow, he had been helping with a trout pond. And he said, you know, I've been helping with this pond and watching his fathers and sons fish together. He says, I've never done that with my boy. I'm sitting at a table with eight men, two, only two guys, myself and Pete that I know. And I got tears running down my face. And God's telling me, this is what I want you to do. 2012, we formed the first father-son retreat for Minnesota Teen Challenge graduates. And the bonding that happens there is amazing. This is a picture of the fellows fishing together, the dads and the sons with the guides. God led us into working with Teen Challenge in this fashion. He has a way of drawing you into where he wants the ministry to go and to work with the people that he wants you to work with. Backing up on that, Rob's hunt camp. You know, we had the first worship service in that barn in 2012. It only took two years from 10 to 12 for us to log side that whole barn and finish the inside of the bunkhouse, get it ready to go. It only took two years. It took 21 years from 1991 when I bought the barn and told me I wanted to start a worship service and a, and a ministry there to 2012, and he had to work on me. And he didn't, do you know why? Because he loves all of you and all the people that come to Legacy Retreats as much as he loves me. Tip wouldn't hire somebody to work for him in a special job if they weren't qualified to do it. I wouldn't qualify yet to do what God wanted me to do. He worked on me for 21 years. It only took him two years to finish the barn. He had all the people, all the resources, everything he needed. It's all set up ahead of time. Here's the worship center today upstairs. And what we've done is uh, we had a donation that came in and we fixed the upstairs, upstairs the barn with lights and the cross and projector and so forth up there. And we use that now. Then, then God added another retreat called Teams for, for Christ. And that's this picture here. Wonderful group of young men that uh, really want to serve the Lord. Then he added another one called Jesus on the River, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more on South Dakota. And then more and more Minnesota Teen Challenge retreats came into the picture, working with the men in the Minneapolis, the Brainerd, and the Rochester facilities, and then working with Lakeside Academy with the Teen Boys and Teen Challenge. What a joy it is to work with those kids coming from hopeless situations in a lot of cases. A lot of them don't have dads. Then God led us to a family retreat we call Pike Point. And that's been a, that's been a lot of fun for, for our families to go together and, and, and spend time. Some of you know that uh, Tip Ennebeck believes in synergy between nonprofits. Tip's theory is two plus two equals six. <clears throat> what? 
In other words, two nonprofits working together can be a force for good that multiplies the good of both of them. This year, Sarah's Grief Counseling Club and Legacy Fishing Retreat worked together to send a family that lost their hus the husband of that family and the father of four boys. And we brought them to our family retreat. They eat with us, they grilled with us, they sang with us, they had campfires with us, they worshiped with us, they had fun together, we'd scavenger, we did all kinds of stuff together. And we took them fishing. Two of us, Mike that's here and myself, took them fishing on, on a pontoon. And they all caught fish. First time in their life they'd ever done that together. Ever done that together. You have never heard one family say thank you so many times in a weekend in your life. Every one of them was so thankful that they got to spend time together in the grief time of their life to have fun and bond together, be with people that are having a good time, and just to be able to enjoy life for a while together. God gets the glory. Jeff had a great idea. Sarah had been called by God to do what she did. The legacy had been called. I love this picture of this little native girl. Kind of tells everything about the joy and the love and the hope that we try to share with the people. We also do uh, three men's Bible studies every week, and any of you, or any of the men, are, can join those. Uh, two are on Zoom, and one's at Cabela's in Rogers. We've been running every Thursday since 2010. We've been going to Cabela's doing that Bible study. Here's a picture of Cody leading the campfire at Red Wing. I tell you, the universal language of uh, good worship music brings people closer to God faster than ever, anything I've found. And the times that we have around those campfires and what the Holy Spirit does is amazing. The father-son retreats. Here's a son with his dad and his grandma arms around him in the worship center. They're bonding. Drugs, alcohol has split them apart. Now they're getting back together. This happens at the Minnesota Tea Challenge family picnic we do for all the men in the programs, all the men in the programs in Minneapolis and their, and their, and their wives and kids. 485 people came this year, almost as many as are here. You should see the bonding that happens there. These kids and these wives get to see these men changed. They want to become men of integrity. They have God in their life, and they've changed, and the bonding is amazing. One more retreat we did that Dale sitting here had an idea and shared with me about. We did a fishing re fishing contest for the kids up in Leech Lake at Onagam, which is on Agency Bay. And when we started, and Dale told me about this idea, I knew we were supposed to do it. We didn't know where. We didn't know when. We didn't know how many people would come. We didn't know where the money was going to come from. We didn't have any of that. In four months' time, God placed in, 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 in our midst the people that could volunteer, the place that we could be, which is Russell Tucker Memorial Beach, Agency Bay. The day we could have, and it was a perfect day, you could see that by looking at the picture here. We had 130 Native people there. 65 kids signed up for that contest. We'd never had one there before. This is all God. And I found out later that Russell Tucker Memorial Beach's sign was in, was dedicated to Russell Tucker, who was the grandson of one of the tribal chiefs of the Ojibwe. And that tribal chief was a Christian, and he raised his children to be Christian, and his grandchildren to be Christian, and I realized we just walked into three generations of planning by God and he set us into that spot. He had planned way before we even, even thought about it. The whole thing. You can't make this stuff up. Here's the award ceremony to the kids getting trophies and they, how happy they are. Legacy fishing retreats started small, but today we do over 16 retreats in a year. Run a 220-person banquet, 485-person picnic for Teen Challenge, 
three Bible studies a week. We touched the lives of 1,160 some people last year. Just to finish up, I, I want to write a poem. I want to read a poem that my mom wrote, and it fits so well with what's going on today's theme here. Look to today, for it is life, the very life of life in Christ. Look to today in faith to know his joy and his peace and his love to show. Look to today in hope to find freedom in him and love for mankind. Look to this day for what you can give. Look to this day to Jesus with courage and live. Good people, God wants us all to be a force for good. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do it. It's been a great honor to share my story with you today. You've been a great audience, and I thank you. I'd like to end in a short prayer, so if you bow your heads for just a minute, appreciate that. Heavenly Father, as we humbly bow before you, please help us all draw close to you today and listen to your counsel, to stand up for what is right, to do good that you have already prepared for us to be a part of, to reach out and to love others. Help us to have the faith, hope, and courage needed to follow your heart plans from generation to generation. Please direct our steps. Now unto you, God, who are able to do exceedingly more than all we can ask or imagine, according to your power that you work through us. To you, God, be all the glory, through Jesus Christ, your Son, and his church to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Like our previous speakers, Taylor Williamson had a passion for life and a passion for the game of hockey. She was, is very good at it. And maybe she thought that was her mission and her purpose in life until it was interrupted. I had a chance to interview her before and it was absolutely delightful and enlightening and inspiring. Our next speaker today, Taylor Williamson. Hi everybody. Well, this is uh, really surreal um, because I have been coming to this for a few years now. Um, it's a day that if you've been here before, we all look forward to it and just find so much inspiration from the people up here. So to be one of those people today um, is pretty crazy, but I'm super excited to share a little bit of my story with you. Um, for me, it, it really begins when, when I was in college. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, um, I grew up born and raised in Edina, Minnesota with my dad, my mom, and my little brother who are on the screen with me right there. Um, and for those of you who know the Williamsons, we are a hockey family. Um, so from a very young age, I knew I was gonna be a hockey player and not just a hockey player but a golden gopher um, and follow in my grandpa and my dad's footsteps, but both are here today. And so I was determined to make sure that my dream became a reality and not just to become a gopher, but be one of the best and then go on to hopefully represent my country and play for the Olympics. So growing up in Edina hockey, all the way from youth through high school, um, that time that I put into the game, it really showed it, it showed itself. I lived and breathed hockey. It became my identity. The wins, I was on a high. The lows, I was devastated. My parents and my little brother specifically know how competitive I can be. But for me, it all kind of came to a peak once I got to college. And for those of you that know Gopher Women's Hockey, it is a very prestigious program. In my freshman year, I was entering a roster that was full of Olympians and All-Americans. So for me, I was like, okay, I just want to dip my toes in. I want to acclimate. 
um, and whatever good I can do for the team, like and whatever I can contribute, that's all I care about. Well, I actually overachieved that that little goal I set for myself by not just being contributing a little bit, but was able to contribute a lot with that team and help us go on to win the national championship in 2016, which for right now is the last national championship that program has. So there I was, just became, a, I was a gopher and just had won the national championship. Two things that when I was six years old, I was striving to do. And after about a week of celebrating and an impulsive trip to Florida with my teammates, I quickly realized that the satisfaction I got from winning went away. And so what does a competitive athlete do in that situation? Well, they go to bed, they wake up, and that next morning they work even harder on their game. What can I do next? What can I achieve more of? Because it's the accolades, it's the success, it's the spotlight that feeds your soul. So that's exactly what I did. I kept working on my craft. Hockey was my identity. It was everything that I want to live for. And it brought me friends, it brought me fame, it brought me joy and praise, and so why wouldn't you love it? Well, that August, I was even one step closer to achieving my dream of becoming an Olympian by making the under 22 national team. And so there I was, my head as high in the clouds as it could be, and even more excited for what my sophomore year of college was gonna bring. Except for the start of my sophomore year, everything kind of started to crash and burn, and that's really where my story begins. During my sophomore season, I was experiencing discouragement for the first time in my career. I wasn't playing where I wanted to be, and all of a sudden I felt my identity stripping away. Who was I without being a successful hockey player? And now on top of that, I was starting to experience some weird symptoms at night. So for about 10 to 15 minutes, I would get weird slurred speech. And I tell people, it's like if you stuck a big spoon of peanut butter in your mouth and tried to talk. I chose to not tell anybody about it because at the end of the day, I was a college athlete. Nothing terrible could be wrong with me and you're trained your whole life to show no weakness. Only be strong and put on your best self. So it's exactly what I did. But after the season ended, and those few months had gone by with the symptoms not going away, I decided to tell my mom about it. And so the next thing you know, in the spring, we were going to a family friend who's a doctor to get a full exam just to figure out what was going on. And we truly went into that thinking it couldn't be anything horrible. Um, if anything, it was maybe a food allergy just from the regimen of what you eat every single day as an athlete. So when we're at the doctor getting that full exam, one thing that we did was get an MRI of my brain. And it was there when the doctor came in, pulled up the MRI, and there lied a mass about the size of my fist on the screen. And Dr. O had then directed us to go right to Methodist Hospital in St. Louis Park for me to undergo emergency brain surgery. And similar to Dan's story, I would say that I was really just in shock through the whole thing. Um, and then I know if you were to talk to my parents and my family, it was a completely different, terrifying situation for them. So there I was less than 24 hours later, undergoing emergency brain surgery. It was crazy. The day before I was at spring training with my team, here I was on the operating table, needing to be saved from what is called an arachnoid cyst sitting on the right side of my brain. The surgery was successful. The surgeon that was at Methodist was literally specialized in that specific surgery alone. So I had so many people tell me that the stars really aligned for me in that moment. The craziest part though, is as soon as I was out of that surgery, my mind was still set on hockey. I was determined to make it back for my season in October for my junior year. So I, I rested, I did what, what a normal person going through brain surgery would do. Um, you start to go stir crazy sitting on the couch, um, not being able to lift anything more than 10 pounds. But as soon as I got the green light to go train again, I went full steam ahead. So in July, as I start to prepare for September, 
I actually start to experience symptoms all over again. The slurred speech had came back, but this time I had muscle weakness in my arms and legs. I had trouble chewing and swallowing on top of speaking. I couldn't really show emotion or smile in my face, and I had double vision and a droopy eye. So we went right back to the doctor to get another MRI, but this time it was a different message. Taylor, your brain is pristine. It looks great, you're recovering phenomenal. So just back off a little bit and things will get better. Well, for any athlete in the room, you know hearing just back off a little bit doesn't work. And I probably gave it a few days, maybe a week, and then I was back to it. Because you're trained your whole life, only show strength, only show perfection, and that's exactly what I did. So there I was from July through September, all alone, living in fear, knowing that there was something unknown inside of me that was killing me every day. The muscle weakness continued and increased. My slurred speech continued and increased. The inability to smile and show emotion increased. And for those of you that know me, I take pride in all those things. I was a hockey player. I was the fun friend in college. I loved going and, and talking with people and being around people. I'm a major extrovert. So there I was in a place where I had to be all alone and be terrified and not knowing what was killing me every day because the easiest tasks became my biggest challenges. So I kept going day by day and it really snowballed when September rolled around and hockey season began. So in our first weekend series against Merrimack in my junior year, I woke up that morning and it was the worst day I had ever experienced in my life. I was too weak to even sit up. I had to log roll out of bed, I tried to brush my hair and put in a ponytail, but I couldn't get my arms above my head. So I just said, okay, let's just get to the rink. After pregame skate, things are gonna get better. So I do that, I go to the rink, but there I was, too weak to even tie my skates and hold on to my stick. So about a minute on the ice, I get off, take my stuff off, I go, okay, after a pregame meal, things are gonna get better. Go to meal and end up not even being able to eat because I couldn't chew and swallow my food. So I choose to go home, go take a nap, okay, things are gonna get better before the game. But this time I couldn't even take a nap. There was something deep inside of me saying, just admit it. Just admit you need help. It's okay. And yet I couldn't do it. So I get to the game, and we're in the first period. It's, I'm un unable to speak to my teammates. I could barely see because my double vision was so bad. My arms were so weak, I could barely hold on to my stick. And my legs were so weak that I could barely skate. So finally, after the first period ended, I went into the lounge um, while the team was in the locker room. And my, my best friend at the time, who was our captain, came in and followed behind me and just put her hand on my back and said, Taylor, are you ready to be done? And I think that was the push I needed. So I just looked at her and nodded because I couldn't, couldn't even talk at the time. And so when the team went to finish the game, I got undressed to go to the hospital. And so while I was at the hospital, I'll, ne I'll never forget just looking and having about 10 doctors surround my bed. And at the time, brain surgery had been the scariest moment of my life, but this had topped it by a mile. I could barely breathe. I couldn't see, I couldn't speak, I could barely move. I felt trapped inside my body. And I know that if I could have talked, I would have asked for them to move my mom out of the room because I truly didn't think in that moment that I would make it. So there I was helpless in that hospital bed and all I could do was pray. So that's exactly what I did. Now up until this point, I believed in God, but I never knew what it meant to have a personal relationship with him. So there I lay and I just said, God, if you are who people say you are, will you please just give these doctors an answer to what is killing me inside? 
So then, as the night went on, we're in the ER room. It was about three in the morning and a resident came in. And actually, by that time, I, I oddly enough could kind of communicate a little bit. So I'm talking with this resident. He says, Taylor, you know, I think I have a weird hunch to what you have. It's a neuromuscular disease called myasthenia gravis. And I said, well, that's great. What do we gotta do to know if that's what I have? And he says, well, we gotta get approval from the attending, but unfortunately he already ruled that out as not something that you have. And I just remember saying, well, if you think I have it, let's run the test. So in ER time, two hours later, he comes back, we take the blood test, the rest of the day continues on, and then I eventually leave the hospital to go home and proceed with day-to-day -day life. So about a week later, um, I'm actually back at school in my communications class in Fort Hall, and I get a call from the doctor, so I step out in the hallway, and all I remember hearing is, Taylor, this is Dr. Smith calling, and I wanted to let you know that your results came back from myasthenia gravis, and that is exactly what you have. And to this day, I still don't remember the rest of the phone call because it was in that moment that I gave my life to Jesus. I thought back to that prayer in that hospital bed, and finally was, had opened my eyes and my heart to what the gospel truly means. And it doesn't make sense. Like, that's where faith, hope, and courage comes into mind. It takes courage to surrender. It truly is the opposite of what the world tells us to do. But I knew that I was about to face the toughest challenge of my life. I will have MG until the day I die. And the only way that I am going to live with this is through Christ. So there I was in Fort Hall, bawling in the hallway by myself. And I ended up leaving early and just rushing out to go where? Straight to the rink. I call my mom, I call my dad to let them know the good news. The doctors put me on treatment right away because it is treated by medication. And so began the road to recovery. And finally this time with hockey not at the center of my life. This time it was with the Lord there. And so the months went by from October to November to December with my mind just focused on being able to live life. Because there was one thing that I said and that it was MG would not define my life, that I would define MG. If you ask my dad, he'd be the first to tell you never Google the diagnosis you're given. <laughs> because it's, it was pretty ugly. And the truth of the fact of what I was diagnosed with, it, it truly is a deathly disease. But with my hope and foundation on the Lord, it changed everything for me. It gave me my purpose. And so I knew whether I was to play hockey or not, I would be able to shine light in spaces with this new gift the Lord blessed me with. So come winter break, everybody goes home. All my teammates go to sit on the couch and rest from a long first half of the season. I actually go home to go straight to Walnut Ridge Park. And so my dad and I would go out there every single day to just try to retrain my body how to play hockey. And again, it wasn't for the motivation to get back to playing. It was the pure joy and love for the game. At the end of the day, hockey was the sport we loved and what brought us all together. But the funny thing is, day after day after day, I really started to see improvement. And some of you may know the name Neil Sheehy, but I went to him then one day to kind of get help. He was a neuromuscular trainer at the time. And him and I were talking, and, he, and I said to him, you know, what if, what if there is a chance I play again? Like everybody tells me I can't, it's not possible, but, but what if God gives me that second chance? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, Taylor, if it's true, if it's in the Lord's will, it's gonna be miraculous. So after that day, leaving that office, I kind of had a new fire in my belly. I wanted to get back to play, but this time for a completely different purpose. 
for God and his glory. So there I go, right into Coach Frost's uh, office to ask him to do something that no coach would ever let their athlete do, which is come back and play. You just had brain surgery and you're diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease. You think I'm going to let you play? But Coach Frost, with so much grace, allowed for me to come back and start to practice with the team. And it started slow. It was one drill a day. Then it was two. Then it was full practices, but just taking it easy. Then it was fully competing every day. Then it was fully dominating. And in that season, um, we weren't doing as well as we had in the past. So a few weeks into our second half, we were playing Vermont. So an Eastern school that on paper we should beat. And after game one, we actually lost. So going into our breakfast the next day, Frosty comes up to me and says, Taylor, if you're cool with it, would love to have you come on the bench because we need your leadership, we need your energy. So of course I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> we'll do anything to put the jersey on again. He goes, but one thing, you are not playing. Get that through your head right now. I go, okay, got it, not gonna play. It's all good. So game goes on. It's about the third period with 10 minutes left. He taps me on the shoulder, just says, okay, Willie, you ready to go in? And I look at him like, told me I wasn't gonna play. <laughs> what? He's like, are you ready to go? And of course I was like, absolutely. So whistle blows, face off in the D zone, and out I go onto the ice. And it is one of the moments, probably top five moments I'll never forget. My entire bench is going crazy. Teammates are crying and hugging. And so for those of you that go to hockey games, you're probably thinking, what's going on? It's a 5-0 hockey game. Why is, why is that bench erupting? And I just remember looking in the stands as I skate to the face off with tears in my eyes, I'm trying to keep it together. But you could see the fans in, in Ritter Arena recognize what was going on. And everybody started to stand and clap. And for me, that was the moment that I realized that I had just done something miraculous. And none of it was with my own strength. The Lord was shining through that moment. And for me, it was just such an honor and blessing to be able to get back on the ice with my teammates again. The Lord had given me a platform to share the gospel, to share the good news. And that was, that was my only mission. It wasn't about the wins and losses. It wasn't about the accolades. It wasn't about becoming an Olympian or an All-American. It was about the Lord. So the game ends after crying in the locker room with my teammates. It just made me realize how blessed I was with the community that I was given. Because at the end of the day, these were the girls that saw me at my worst, yet saw me for who I truly am. And then I got to run upstairs and hug my dad and hug my family because it, without them, I wouldn't be here today. Because it truly takes a village. So the season goes on, and I continue to play. And not that it matters, but I was playing probably the best hockey of my life. <laughs> All because it was for a different purpose. It was about pouring into my teammates. It was about the interviews after games and giving glory to God. Hockey is just a gift. It's not my life. It's not who I am. I'm a child of God. And so, as the story goes, like I told you, the, uh, the season wasn't going great. So the only way for us to make it to the national tournament was to beat the number one team at the time, Wisconsin, in our WCHA tournament. And so... I actually end up scoring that game-winning goal to punch a ticket to our, for our team to go to the tournament. Again, just what a sweet gift. And an old Taylor would have taken so much pride in, in that goal. 
But again, it was like one of those moments where every single girl in that locker room goes, of course it was you. And God's love just spread through that that locker room like wildfire that year. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't gone before, to go to a Gopher Women's Hockey game today. Because at the end of the game, you're going to see a huddle of about 20 young women, including some players from the other team, that take a knee and pray. They play for an audience of one. They play for something bigger than themselves. And I feel like God put me in that locker room, in that place for a reason, and was able to use my story and weakness to show his good and glory. So I go on, the season ends, go into my senior year, and just have a blast. Uh, my dad and I called it overtime hockey, some extra hockey. Just enjoying the moment, embracing the journey, and again, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do in that next chapter of life. So today, I'm lucky enough I get to work for a tradition company, Tradition Mortgage, and I also give back by coaching. But more importantly, my family has really come up behind me in a vision that the Lord had given me one day as I was going through my, my uh, recovery in wanting to create a one-stop shop, center of excellence for people like me. And not even just people with MG, but any sort of neuromuscular disease. Because at the end of the day, we all come in here with our baggage. We all come in here with a thorn in our side. And so it's easy to to stare at that thorn, to pay attention to the paper cut on your finger. But if you're able to see the hope that is greater, you're able to surpass that and overcome that obstacle. And so for me, with MG, I knew I wanted to create a place that reminded people of our one true hope. So we created a fundraiser um, the past couple of years. The first one, was, it was called Peddling for a Prayer. And then this past summer, we did Pickling for a Prayer. And would you uh, please raise your hand if you attended the event? Because I'm sure a lot of you were here. So yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, we've actually been able to raise over $250,000 to create this vision that the Lord had given It's going to be in the Neuroscience Center in St. Paul, so there's truly a physical space. This this vision is becoming a reality. It's a vehicle that so many people, so many friends and family have jumped in on, and I truly couldn't be more thankful. Um, I even brought up here our pickleball paddle, and if you want to take your pickleball game to the next level, if you buy this, some of the money goes toward our foundation. It has a QR code on here. It says Taylor vs. MG, and really is just a good conversation starter for where'd you get that racket? Um, so again, would love for you to come up and, and buy one if you'd like. Um, but again, it's it's crazy because here I am at 27 years old. I achieved my dream of becoming a Golden Gopher. It was some of the best four years of my life. But I'm not an Olympian. I've become something that is far greater and have been labeled and given an inheritance that's eternal. For me, that's all I need. And so my, my encouragement to everybody is, is to lean into whatever that thorn is on your side. The verse I wanted to share with you is 2 Corinthians 12.9. And it's Paul pleading to God to remove the thorn that's from his side, whatever it may be. And God's reply to him was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. For me, when I read that the first time, it pretty much jumped out on the page and slapped me in the face because I realized that's exactly what God was doing. I needed to boast in weakness, something I hadn't done my entire life so that God can be glorified in that moment. So, it's a story still being written, um, and I'm excited to see the journey that he takes us on. Um, So thank you for listening, and appreciate you all.
Wow. I, I interviewed her before and listened to her here. You made me cry twice today, Taylor. Don't do that to me. I got to hold this together. That's an amazing story. And I see my friend Grandpa Murray sitting right there, and I hope you're beaming with pride over there. I know you are as part of that Williamson hockey family, somebody I haven't seen for a while. You guys did good. You did really good. Thank you, Taylor. One day, right? One moment. You don't know what day it is. It's going to change your life. But that's been kind of the theme for the day. Our final speaker personifies that times 10. One day. One day you think you're this, and you find out the rest of your life will be different. Our final speaker today, Aaron Holm. It's like being on the tee box and seeing uh, three balls in the middle of the fairway about 290 yards up. Kind of hoping when you're playing a scramble. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, Taylor, Rob, Dan, Johnny, amazing. Um, fantastic, tough to follow. Chip, thanks for the confidence, the invitation, entire tradition family. Nina, thanks for putting up with me for the planning. You put it all together. This is incredible, uh, incredible night and day to be a part of. So, yeah, my name is Aaron Holm. I live in the southern metro here with my wife, Amanda, and our, our children, Jacqueline, Evan, and, and Gavin. My mom's here as well. I better acknowledge that. So we're going to be going to be hanging out with us this afternoon. But my story, the story that I'm going to share with you tonight, or today, uh, starts back on January 2nd of 2007. I was working uh, for an IT and engineering consulting firm managing uh, an incredible group of people, about 150 people, working out of downtown Minneapolis, the Butler Square building, if you're familiar with it. My wife, Amanda, was working in, in IT at Target Corporation, to mention three young kids at the time. Just a very, very busy, active, um, I guess, cutthroat business, a lot of excitement, just had a phenomenal team. I would returned to work on January 2nd after spending some time with the family over the holidays, took a couple weeks off just to be home for Christmas and uh, get caught up with, with our kids. And, and we had some family in town that were staying with us. And, um, returned to work and I was getting caught up with my team. We had a group of, of sales representatives and recruiters and, and HR and, and uh, administrative staff. I was getting caught up with them, kind of going through our first quarter and annual goals for the new year. And the first call that came in that day was from one of my administrative assistants. And she was letting me know that she had a flat tire. She was stranded on the side of the highway on 394, just outside of downtown Minneapolis. She said she had some help coordinated, just wanted to give us a heads up. And we said, uh, you know, be safe. We'll see you when you get in. Short time later, she called back, letting us know that the help she had summoned uh, wasn't available. She didn't know what she was going to do. January 2nd, we all know what the temperature was, probably zero at the time. She was about four months pregnant. So I just interrupted the meeting and I said, hey, I'll be, I'll be back. I'm going to go pick her up, get her off the highway. So I headed out east on or west on uh, 394 and hit Hopkins Crossroad and came back and I could see her car on the, the shoulder of the highway on the far right. And as I pulled up next to her, I made the determination, I made the decision that I would help her change her tire and hopefully get her and her car off the highway to safety. So I thought, in the process of changing her tire, an individual traveling at 55 miles an hour struck me from behind, pinning me between the two vehicles. As other speakers said tonight, yeah, in an instant, you know, one of those things, you've heard it before, but certainly in an instant, things change. I was conscious. I was laying on my stomach. Could imagine the things going through my mind. The first thing was, this is, this is a dream. This is a bad dream. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any discomfort. Laying on my stomach on the side of 394 as cars were whipping by at 55, 60 miles an hour, just assuming it was just a fender bender. They didn't see me laying between the two cars. Tried to get up, 
realized quickly that something was was very wrong. You know, going from from uh, uh, laying on the stomach to standing upright never was an issue for me. It just it wasn't working. Something wasn't working. So I glanced over my shoulder, and that's when I realized the extent of the damage that had taken place. A lot of things went through my mind. First of all, I didn't know if I was going to live. I didn't know if I was ever going to walk again. It's probably a little pissed because I just put on some new Michelins on the car that, that was damaged. That, that's not true. But, um, but I lay there, and I, I didn't pray, but I certainly gave thanks. I, I just thought of the family. I thought of the kids. I thought how fortunate it was that it was me and not one of them. I didn't hear sirens. I didn't know if help was coming. My administrative assistant was in shock. She wasn't going to be able to help with anything. But fortunately, a woman had seen the impact, had seen me between the two vehicles and had pulled up about a quarter mile up the road, up 394, hopped out of her car, ran back. When she saw the extent of the damage, she called in for help. Laying there, I eventually heard the the ambulance coming, or what I thought was the ambulance, it turned out to be the police car taking the same route that I had just taken minutes before. They showed up. They were very surprised to see an individual laying on the ground and the damage that, that, had, uh, that I had suffered. So they made a couple calls, and eventually the ambulance came and picked me up off the side of the road. It felt like forever, but once I was stabilized and put in the ambulance and brought to North Memorial Hospital, I realized that I was going to survive. The extent of the damage was tremendous. We soon discovered that I would be a bilateral above the knee amputee. Both legs above the knee were gone. On the way to the hospital, I routed my wife's contact information to the EMT in the passenger seat who made a phone call. She happened to be at the bus stop putting her kids on the bus when she got that call. She walked into the hospital room. I grabbed her by the hand and I said, we are gonna need a lot of help here. This is, this is a, a world we have never been in before in our life. I have no idea what the rest of our life can look like, but we're gonna need help. And the first thing that came to my mind, probably because all the commercials were inundated with, was we're gonna need an attorney. But, but saying that kind of sparked what would happen going forward. We weren't gonna sit around and wait until individuals came and told us what to do next. We were going to take action. So that was just one of the things. But as people started showing up to the hospital to see how I was, as people called in, Amanda and my friends started saying, hey, do you have any bandwidth? We got to figure this out. All we know is he's going to be, he's, he's missing both of his legs above the knee. We don't know what the capabilities are. We don't know if he's ever going to walk again. We know he's going to survive. We know there's going to be a lot of surgeries but we got to figure this out. So anybody who had any bandwidth stepped up and said, we're going we're gonna to do the diligence. We're going to go out. We're going to start talking to people. We're going to start making phone calls. And after a day and a half, two days, they gathered around with what we determined would be the 10 components of recovery for a bilateral above the knee amputee. You can read them there. I don't need to go over them, but two of them kind of stick, they stick out to me today, the, the, the the physical therapy one, the physical therapy two. If you saw me walking up the steps, you can see that I'm gonna, I depend on my upper body more than, I, more than most people do in this room. And that's what we figured out early on is I can start right away working on my upper body, staying in shape because eventually we would be fit with a set of prosthetics that would allow me to ambulate. I went three days without knowing if I was ever gonna walk again when one of our project team managers came into the hospital room with a, the brochure that I'm showing our youngest son in the sweet turtleneck right there. <laughs> Mom, did you dress him that day? I never asked you that, but that's, that's, that, that, that disappeared when I returned home. But uh, we're probably back in now. But the, the picture on the right, his name is Heath. That was the picture that I was showing our son, Evan, at that time. And that was the, the check the box moment. That's it. That's what we're going after. These, these prosthetics are intelligent. They're intuitive. They have computers in them. He's walking with his kid on the shoulder. That was one check the box moment in our life. Within three days, 
we had a team, uh, contractors, tearing apart our house and putting it back together. We recognized that I would be dependent on a wheelchair for an amount of time until I could ultimately heal up and, and uh, um, get fit with prosthetics. 19 days later, 12 surgeries, I left North Memorial Medical Center to a fully accessible home. I returned home in an accessible van with a wheelchair. I was able to wheel up the steps after getting approval from our dog. And I was able to get upstairs using the stair lift that had been installed. That night I was able to tuck our kids into bed, read them a book, and start what we called our, our new normal. 19 days after the setback. I knew there was going to be a lot of time. I, I think it was Taylor that said the, the, the downtime that you, when you go through something like this, the amount of time that I would take with nothing, absolutely nothing to do. So we went from 120 miles an hour down to zero in an instant. So I knew I needed to fill up the, the space and time as much as I could going forward, maybe for sanity purposes, but, but just, just for my own health. My neighbor's a physical therapist. He would come over every day after work, lay out the regimen for the day. He'd circle back 24 hours later, make sure I'm staying in shape. But during the day, we would try to be as normal as we could. I had time, so I had an accessible van. I was able to throw the kids in the car, bring them to their skating practices. Uh, Jacqueline was a figure skater. Gavin was just starting out. I had taught our oldest son and daughter to skate. My wife and I had, had taught our oldest son and daughter to skate on the lake behind our house. Obviously with a setback that had taken place, we're not gonna be able to do that. So we got creative. I would go to uh, show and tell. I was both show and tell. After about four months, my body healed up. And I was ready, I was so excited. The picture in the middle was my first day putting my new prosthetics on. I knew they were intelligent. I knew they were gonna allow me to do so much of the things that, that I had lost from losing my legs because the technology that I would be dependent on. I, I showed up, threw on the prosthetics, and tried to take my first step. It took me an hour to realize that it wasn't gonna happen that day. That's the only amount of time we had allocated. I kept trying just to get the knee to bend. One hour just to get the knee to bend, and I, I failed miserably. I could not do it. I went home so frustrated. Eventually, I started walking, and the two side pictures are at physical therapy. But I wasn't making the progress that I wanted to make. So I had to get creative. So I called my neighbor, who was a physical therapist. I said, Scott, can you put in some parallel bars in my basement? I just got to figure out how to get to the basement so I could use them because the stair lift goes upstairs, but there's nothing to get me downstairs. So getting creative, I would hop on my, uh, the kids 50 CC Kawasaki. I would drive around the back. My neighbors today, they think, they think I'm absolutely crazy because this is days from being released from the hospital or months from being released from the hospital. There's snow on the ground and I'm whipping through the backyard on a little uh, Kawasaki 50 CC. But it allowed me to get to the basement where I had my helpers there. My, my legs are sitting there. I would transfer over into the wheelchair, put my prosthetics on, and I would walk on those parallel bars. Fortunately, at the time, our, our basement was unfinished, so we could sacrifice a wall. But I would walk. One lap was the, the first day I was down there was one lap. It was a little frustrating, but I knew I had the freedom now to do as much as I could in a day on my own independently. About the same time as this is going on, well, what I did at this point was took the eight feet. My goal the first day was eight feet. I said, tomorrow I'm going to walk 16 feet. The next day I'm going to walk 32 feet. And I know the mortgage people are in here up to, what, 164 already. But let's, let's, let's. Um, so I just set small goals. I would improve myself every day that I would get downstairs, put on those legs, which was a feat in itself and just walk, walk as much as I could. About the same time um, June's approaching, I knew that it was uh, the last day of school was approaching, so I, I set a goal to walk the kids down to the bus stop on the last day of school. I lost sleep that night because I realized that all the walking that I had been doing is in, the, in this in controlled environment, a flat surface, typically parallel bars, 
lot of times you'd have uh, uh, somebody spotting you, you know, uh, a physical therapist spotting you. So it wasn't real, and I lost sleep realizing that I have to walk down a small grade, a driveway, and I had no idea how these legs were going to react to just a gradual slope of the driveway. So that was about as tedious as, as an able-bodied person running a marathon, in my opinion. I, I probably went home and took a nap because walking that 100 yards to and from the bus stop was absolutely exhausting. About the same time, some friends called me up and said, hey, the golf tournament's coming up. We played in the, uh, the hockey, local hockey association's golf tournament every year, and uh, they let me know that the, the, the fundraiser's coming up, and I was one of the four on the team, and I gently reminded them that some things had changed in my life, and I was barely standing up, let alone taking some steps, but uh, golfing probably wasn't an option. Well, they called BS on that and said, show up, you're on the team. We teed off on, they teed off on number 10 at Stonebrook, if you're familiar with that. Three guys hit the, hit the ball well down the middle of the fairway. We're about 100 yards out from the green. And a buddy of mine said, get out of the, get out of the cart. <laughs> I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, this is, this is when they try to shoot me out of a cannon, right? But, uh, so I got out of the cart. He reached into his golf bag and he pulled out a swim noodle. You know what a swim noodle is? The kids use it to uh, float around the swimming pool, or we, we use it around to flo float around the swimming pool. In the middle, it's hollow. He had taken a rope and put the rope down the middle of the swim noodle. He said, I'm going to put this around your stomach. I'm going to be behind you 5, 10 feet. I'm going to hold you up. When you swing the golf club, everything you're going to, well, your entire momentum is going to go forward, but I'm not going to let you go forward. I'm like, all right, it looks good on paper. He had me a pitching wedge, and I addressed the ball. I felt the resistance, which, which made me you know, feel pretty comfortable and confident. I took a nice gradual slope at that, that golf ball and popped it up. It hit about 15 feet short of the green, rolled up, hit the pin, and went low. <laughs> An eagle on my very first shot without legs, right? <laughs> This is about five holes later, and you can see the confidence there. Yeah. <laughs> but what you can also see, and I, I, I had to save this slide, is one handed, one hand in his pocket, <laughs> and I'm fearing for my life taking this swing at this golf club. And Dan's back there with a cocktail in his hand, just kind of like staying out of arm's reach in case something goes bad, you know. But, anyways, I had, I had to save that. So the next. The next weekend we flew out to Colorado and I was invited to play. I wasn't expecting it, but we came up with the other the swim noodle and I played nine holes on this course. And since then I've been golfing, standing up by myself with, without any assistance. But what that did for me, every time I finished up 18 holes and I played 25 rounds of golf between June and September of that last of that year, every time I came off that golf course, my confidence level was what was up. I knew what these legs were gonna do. The undulating surf the undulating greens, the, the cart pass, the sand, the sprinkler heads, all the stuff that goes into a, a golf a round of golf allowed my brain to kind of memorize what these legs are gonna do in certain situations. So it, it just helped me tremendously. That was my physical therapy. That helped me more than anything else I could have done in the parallel bars or, or at the PT office. So things started getting back to, I guess, normal. I was introduced to a few different sports. Um, sled hockey, I played for the Minnesota Wild sled hockey team for many years. I picked up a couple bikes. One is a, a house bike, it's a, it's a hand bike. Getting back to just the sport court with the kids and, and then playing golf and then obviously getting back to what we used to love to do as a family. That top left photo was me walking that same sidewalk that I had walked just months prior fearing for every step, looking down to see if my feet were actually touching the ground, wondering if my knee was going to buckle. And now we've got, what do we got there? Soccer balls and kids and bikes and probably a dog or cat fighting in there somewhere, but the confidence was back. So we had received a lot of phone calls and emails through my recovery from individuals telling us my uncle's coming back from Afghanistan or my cousin was in a motorcycle accident, 
my husband had developed cancer, and you know, in, in all these instances, it, it resulted as limb loss or an amputation. Where did you go? What did you do? How? What kind of prosthetics are you wearing? What kind of physical therapists did you have? And then at that time, we realized how much that the community surrounding me, the people that came to help me out, to help us out as a family, how much, how powerful that was in my recovery. And visiting people in the hospital and realizing they haven't given any thought after being in the hospital for six months, how to modify their home, they can get up the, the four steps it's gonna to take to get in their house. We realized at that time that we were given a, an incredible gift, that we need to give back to people that suffer limb loss or have limb difference. So we formed Wiggle Your Toes in 2008. It's an organization that gives back to the limb loss, limb difference community. And I say limb difference, a child that uh, was born congenital is, is, is more of a, a limb difference. Limb loss would be amputation. The three pillars of Wiggle Your Toes are heal, recover, and flourish. That heal is that ever important advocacy I wish somebody had visited me at the hospital and said, it's gonna be okay. You know, I waited 24 to 36 hours to see a prosthetic, a picture of somebody walking with a prosthetic with their child. And that, that's when it hit me that things were gonna be okay. Caregiver support team, um, visiting individuals in the hospital. This is one of our board members, Courtney at Mayo, visiting a young gal that uh, just had her leg removed from osteosarcoma. And then the other photo is our team at Boston Medical Center. We were called in uh, days after the Boston uh, Marathon bombings to meet with the survivors of the bombing and also meet with the, the caregivers and the medical staff. We were back and forth about five times over the next several months to help people heal, recover, and flourish. Recover is modifications to home. I, I returned after 19 days, you saw, but my home was fully accessible. I did have those hurdles that most people have. So we go in and modify homes. We provide transportation and do a lot of things people need at that stage in recovery. We do a lot of clinics. Anything that anybody wants to do, we'll consider it. Believe it or not, individuals that have lost limbs, a limb, wanted a skateboard, so we partnered with the X Games a few years back and hosted a skateboard clinic at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Bike clinic, we have a weight surf clinic, we have a snowboard clinic, we teach people to golf, we help people garden, we partner them with other people that, that have passions and line them up to allow them to see their full potential post limb loss, limb difference. We've developed several Paralympic athletes, but that's not our goal. Our goal is just to keep people active. We certainly believe that movement is medicine. Sorry about the foggy picture, but that's the University of Minnesota Fieldhouse, where beginning December 15th, well, mid-December through the entire winter, we rent out the Fieldhouse at the University of Minnesota and allow people in our community to come in. It could be someone that was just fit with a prosthetic last week that is nervous to take their first steps. We help them take maybe one lap around the track. Next week it might be two. At the end of the season, we have several of these individuals participate in Goldie's Run, which is a, a short run around the U of M campus. We've had several people come to this that are barely taking their first steps that finish a two and a half mile race at the end of the season. So we're giving back to that community. But again, anything that anybody wants to do, we try to align them with someone with their same level of loss, level of interest, passion, and drive to make that happen. We also buy a lot of running blades for individuals. I think last count, we've, we purchased over 110 running and fitness components that we fit on kids and adults who want to be active post limb loss. Insurance companies do not deem fitness prosthetics medically necessary, so we make it happen. We do whatever we can to, to put these on our kids. So that's wiggle your toes. Just a quick story to close, but about a year ago, I was contacted by an individual by the name of Tim Herman, who was in the community. He's a, a congenital uh, below the knee, um, wears a prosthetic, and he's a very, very good golfer, avid golfer. And he let me know that he was going to captain the Adaptive Ryder Cup, the equivalent to the Ryder Cup. And he asked me if I would be interested in being on the team. 
Well, it was a year ago, right? So I said, absolutely. That sounds fantastic. I would love to do it. Thanks for your confidence in me. And thought about it a lot and got excited and, you know, obviously shared shared with a family and some, some close friends what was going on. And then 2023 came and the golf season came and I played the worst golf I've ever played in my life. I think I had it in the back of my head that at some point I was going to be representing Team USA in this golf tournament. And I could not get it together. Several rounds that I just could not figure out the game of golf. So it entered my mind that I got to quit. I got to call the captains up and let them know that they need to pick an alternate or find somebody else to, to join the team because I can't, I, I just can't figure this game out. But then the thought crossed me of going to my kids and my family and my friends and saying, I quit. And there's no way I could do that. So I got it together. I, I worked with my wife on some flexibility, some time. She's a golfer too, so she got out. We got out together as much as we can. And as it progressed towards the end of August, I figured it out. I played my best round mid-August, about two weeks prior to flying out to Santa Barbara to join my teammates. So late August, I flew out, joined my teammates, met a, met a lot of just incredible people. And uh, um, practice round was Sunday. Monday, Tuesday were the, the competitive rounds, best ball and then alternate shot. And then I won both matches, by the way, uh, Monday, Tuesday. Going into the third round, we were tied with Europe. I was the last foursome to tee off, the last person to tee off in that foursome. I was partnered with Ken Green, you might know the name, played 19, 1989, he played uh, um, the actual Ryder Cup, the able-bodied Ryder Cup um, with Mark Kelkovecchia against the Europeans. I think it ended up in a tie, so it was just a, a blast to play with him. But we proceeded, we made the turn, which means you're going from ninth hole to 10th hole. I was two strokes down from um, my, my uh, European competitor. And after 15 holes, I was one down, and uh, Ken won his match. So he said, I, you know, we didn't know what the score was. We had no idea what was going on. Nobody was checking in with us. But Ken took off, so now it's just me and my European competitor. I'm one stroke down. We're going into hole 16, and I see people coming out of the woods and coming off the cart pass. And by the time we're getting up on the tee box, both teams, the European and Team USA, are with us. We're the only two people on the course. I went par par to tie it up going into 17 and sank an eight foot putt to win my match and later figure out or to be told that I won the match for Team USA. So go Team USA. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> golf again. But again, thank you for the opportunity to share my story tonight. Um, thank you to the other speakers. Thank you to Chip and Team Tradition. Thank you all for listening. Have a good evening. Thank you to our marvelous speakers. Let's hear it for them one more time. Reminding us of what, why we're really here, right? And thank you. Each and every year he does this. He doesn't want the credit. It's not about his business. It's not about growing his business. It's about doing the right thing. Tim Benebeck has been that quiet soldier to do that because he believes that he's been blessed and he believes that he has to give back and he believes he's obligated to do that through things like this, faith, hope, and courage, but he does it every day, as many of you know, with a whole bunch of different causes. Let's hear it for the one and only, the icon that doesn't want the recognition or the attention for this. Tip Benabat.
We're not done. You can continue to socialize in the back. And if you get a chance, please say thank you to our marvelous speakers today for preparing, for motivating, and for taking the time to come up here and leave their comfort zone and do something for us. Have a great rest of the day and drive safely, everybody.